Bullshit. Pretend for a moment we've entered a parallel universe, free of bullshit and full of bold solutions. That's what the No BS Show is all about. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. Let's cut the bullshit. When I complain about the misuse of reply to all or CC in emails, heads nod in agreement and glaring examples are provided. It happens regularly because we don't answer some basic but key questions when we're sending emails. Number one, do I need to respond? You don't need to respond all the time. Sometimes you're just being updated or kept in the loop. Use judgment when deciding whether or not to respond. I'm not saying you can ignore emails. That would be BS. But simply use discretion to save everyone time. Number two, what happens if I don't include each person who is on the email? When you're writing an initial email, decide how each person will use the information. If it's not obvious that they need the email, don't CC them. When responding, you also don't need to hit reply to all if your response isn't useful to each person on the email string. If you have a quick clarification or constructive feedback that involves only the sender, you probably shouldn't CC everyone. I realize some readers might feel the need to cover themselves by including more people on emails because they work in places that maybe have a little BS in their culture, but you're also wasting people's time by unnecessarily creating cluttered email strings. Number three, how would you handle it if you were having a face-to-face conversation? This is the key, folks. How would you handle it if you were having a face-to-face conversation? When multiple people are emailed via the two box, you should reply to all unless something is confidential to the original sender. Think of what you would do in a real conversation. If someone said something to you and another person at lunch, would you respond by whispering in that person's ear? Probably not. You'd likely talk to both people. Do the same thing in an email. Number four, does everyone on this email need the information to do their job? When three or four people are working on a project and your response impacts them, remember to hit reply to all. Forgetting to do so frustrates everyone who is left out and stifles productivity. The converse is also true. Don't add people to the recipient list unless you're sure they need the information to do their job. You might think these tips are obvious or common sense. Take a quick look through your inbox and sent folder. You'll realize it's not as obvious or common as you think and that you might be guilty of some of these things. Do what you can to change it. Start asking and answering these four questions that we'll have on the show notes and improve your email communications. And email me at dave at masssolutions.biz your favorite or should I say least favorite examples of people misusing the CC or reply to all. If you send me the email with your examples, I'll send you a free signed copy of Get Where You Want to Go or a No BS Marketing t-shirt, which to date have only been given to the guests. You send me the email and tell me which one of those two gifts you want. It's dave at masssolutions.biz. Our guest today is Jamie Proton, principal of the Proton Group, a firm that provides business development, advocacy, and coaching services to companies. He was VP of Business Development at Chester Engineers just prior to starting his own firm serves as president of the Mon Valley Chamber of Commerce and on the board of Leadership Washington County. Jamie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. We're happy to have you. And I got to tell our audience, you're lucky that the record button was hit because Jamie and I started talking basketball, which I didn't realize that he's a basketball guy. So instead of the usual five-minute pre-interview talk, we were talking for like 10 minutes, started drawing up plays, Bobby Knight's name came up and there Jamie go. Dixon's came up and yeah. coaches in the high school area from the areas here. So Jamie, we got a lot to talk about about you though. Walk us through your educational background and your career journey. Well, my my uh, my educational background and journey in general has been a little bit off the beaten path. Um, when my wife and I were my my former wife, but we were very very young in college. Um, became pregnant and had our first daughter. And um, as shocked as I was to find out at the time at 19 years old that, you know, babies want to eat. They, they're, they're selfish like that. So my, uh, my college career was interrupted. I had to get a job. And uh, one thing led to another, tried to take night classes. And then my son arrived and continued that for a while. It was very draining. And then daughter number two arrived. So um, by that point, 
I was in my late 20s, had a mortgage, had car payments, and all of these different things. So uh, the education piece got put on hold. I do have an associate degree in mechanical engineering technology, which um, really kind of led me to my career path totally by accident. Uh, I was when we first found out when we were in school, we were out in the state of California and we came back here. This was in the around, around 79, 80. And um, a friend of my father's was the district engineer at PennDOT District 11 up in Uniontown, Vance Decas. And uh, my dad called him and said, Hey, you know, the kid needs a job. He's got a family now. He's got, you know, you help him out. So I went up to see him. One thing led to another. And first job I really had in the engineering business was a pen dog. And that lasted for, for about a year. And I was on a construction site and I met an engineer was, uh, it was a, just a utility relocation. And the guy, for whatever reason, liked me. And it, that started my, really my career path being just luckily being in the right place at the right time. So he, he liked me and he gave me his card and he said, Hey, give me a call, you know, one day when you have some time, let's talk. So a couple weeks later, I did, and um, we went and had lunch, and he said, you know, what you're doing is, is probably a lot of fun when you're, when you're 21, 22. He said, but believe me, the day's going to come where you're not going to want to be out in the weather. You're not going to want to be out in a ditch. So if you're interested, I might have a job for you. So we talked about it, and, uh, and, and we agreed, and I took a job as a draftsman, a board draftsman. And this is pre-CAD. That's how... Uh, old I am. It predates AutoCAD, which is the industry standard right now in MicroStation. This, those didn't even exist then. So this was on vellum or linen with a ruling pen, ink. Okay, you had to dip the pen and everything. And we actually had to start drawing from the upper left-hand corner and draw down to the lower right to give the ink time to dry. So it was a, uh, it was a unique experience. Wow. And that was with a local engineering firm, Westmoreland Engineering Company. And I learned so much from this gentleman, Robert Quinn. And the thing that was great about Bob Quinn was that he had a high school diploma. He went in the military right out of high school. And when he got out of the military, he got a job at PennDOT, which he always referred to as the Pennsylvania Department of Highways because it wasn't PennDOT then. And um, he, his career kind of went that way. And Bob is the guy that basically designed Interstate 79 from Washington to Erie. And it was his baby. And probably still today, after 30 some odd years in his business, the best seat of the pants engineer I've ever worked with or ever seen. And um, so that was, I was grateful for that. I worked under Bob for about seven years and he literally taught me everything technical that I know. Um, so I consider myself to have a master's degree in engineering, especially on the civil side. And um, if not for him, I wouldn't have gone to the next step. So at that point, uh, Bob was ready to retire, so I got an offer from a slightly bigger firm, still local, and I went to uh, I went to work for them, and it it was really cool because it gave me an opportunity to then bring Bob back into the mix with me. He was retired, and we needed some help. Couldn't afford anybody full time, so I called him and said, "Hey, you know, you getting bored yet? You want to come out and help out?" So he actually came on you know, as needed part-time and, and helped us out with some designs and things like that. So that was a really cool kind of dynamic reversal there of, of roles. And then I still had a guy that was still mentoring me and, and teaching me what I needed to know. So from there, I, uh, I got my first, and I've actually have two tours of duty with Chester engineers in two different capacities. Um, around 2000, I had gotten really more into the marketing side of engineering with existing clients, bringing in new projects and growing projects and things like that. So I went to work at Chester Engineers as a senior project manager, basically still doing hands-on engineering type things. So not designing because I'm not a professional engineer, So, but on the project management and construction management side. But as I started to have some success with clients, they asked me to get more into a business development marketing role. So after... in that was in 2000, probably in early 2008, I was the director of marketing and business development at Chester. And I got an opportunity yet to get even bigger and expand because, you know, you always wonder what it's like the other guys like. You know, you yes. see these big companies and, you know, wonder what it's like being, you know, doing what that guy does. So I had some friends that, at AECOM right over here in 
Gateway 4. And uh, we had been working on some mutual projects, and they had an opening. They needed a business development guy, a BD guy. And um, so I kind of jumped at that. And at the end of the day, it was a great opportunity because I was able to have responsibility that I couldn't have at Chester. Even though Chester is a national firm, we were a firm of about 250 people. AECOM is the largest engineering firm on the planet. I mean, they're, they're just monstrous. So I was the business development marketing manager for the Mid-Atlantic region based here in Pittsburgh, but that was over 3,500 employees in about seven states. So I was responsible for marketing and business development. And, you know, that was huge, right? So I kind of got a baptism under fire. You know, they weren't, they weren't going to hold your hand or coddle you or anything at that point. So I spent, I spent three years there. And um, what was really cool about it was one of my mentors, Marvin Williams, who's based in Dallas, Houston, Texas. Marvin taught me everything I know about business development and marketing. Uh-huh. So I was still working with Marvin even though I had switched firms because he was a, an independent uh, consultant. And then Marvin is the guy that intrigued me enough to look at going back to Chester. They wanted to get into the oil and gas industry and some different things, and um, they needed some help getting there. So they offered me a vice president's position to come back to Chester and kind of lead their business development and marketing team. The only problem I had with that was that it came with direct reports, and I'd never had direct reports before. It was just me doing my thing, Uh doing what I do with clients and client relations and all those things. And it was really just more instinctual than anything else. You know, it was, it came from a, a talent for people and just being literally a Valley guy. You know, we learned how to deal with people at a very young age. And that's really what my biggest talent or skill is, if you can call that a talent. So having direct reports was a different experience for me. I had, I had graphic designers, I had writers, I had you know, proposal writers and things like that. So that was a little bit of a challenge because I still had to maintain my national accounts. Okay, so we had guys, business developers and um, relationship guys around the country. And then I had this marketing team in-house. So managing all of that and making sure that those people had their needs met, which I think is very important. So I think one thing that people miss in business is, and in in Marvin Williams is the one that always said this to me, the business of business is people. Okay, he taught me that when you, when you learn to look at your customers as people, not customers, then you, anything you need to put out to them, okay, your message, your, your, your platform, becomes easier because then all of a sudden they're not a target they're not a goal they're just people just like you and I are and that brought that down to a place where I could understand it and at that point that's when things really took off not only at Chester but but just all the way around and um, you know I still can reach out to Marvin to this day Um, we I've developed a national network as a result of that relationship and I have people in San Diego, in Houston, in Atlanta, in Boston that I can call on. So when somebody asks me how many employees I have at the Proton Group, it's literally several hundred because I have all of these resources because of that relationship building and that network that I developed over the course of the last 30 years. It's the No BS Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. That's Jamie Proton, our guest. You touched on something that's critical to this show because this show is really about leadership and communication. We like to talk about mentors. It sounds like you definitely mentioned two in detail, but maybe even a third. I'm going to go back to Vance Decas. So when I first took the job as vice president at Monongahela Valley Hospital when I was in my late 20s, uh, they were giving me directions to drive there, and I'd drive past the sign that says the Vance Decas yes. Expressway, I think. Mm-hmm. So when you get a road, an expressway named after you, you had to be doing something. So let's talk about him. Was he a mentor as well? Uh, yes. He and actually his son, Carl. Um, and it, it's it's interesting how the world is really a very small place, okay? When my father reached out to Vance and he got me that first job, well, Vance had, was kind of the P.T. Barnum of engineering. He wasn't the traditional, you know, uh, 
guy carrying around a, a pen with, you know, glasses with tape in the middle and, you know, the white shirt with a tie. You know, Vance was the kind of guy that would roll up his sleeves or, or his pant legs, for that matter, and wade out into the river and look at something or, or climb a, a ladder. He was, he was a really hands-on guy. He was, you know, the, the, the joke about engineers, if you want to you you walk into a room and you want to know which guy's the engineer, just look at the guy that's looking at his shoes. You know, and, mm-hmm. it, but that's, that, Vance was the opposite of that. I mean, he was a guy that had personality, he was outgoing. And um, so as a result of that, I got to know his son, Carl, who's about five years older than me. And I wouldn't have known Carl other than that because he was, you know, in a different, kind of a different dynamic. But Carl was a brilliant nuts and bolts kind of engineer, just a very bright guy. And, but he was a guy who, you know, literally had a walk-up storefront engineering business. Okay. And, and Carl and I did a lot. We started doing a lot of different things together. And um, we would, we would have lunch a couple times a month just to, you know, just to keep in touch and touch base when we didn't have a project going on. And one day Carl told me that, you know, he was just wearing out, you know, owning the firm and he didn't really see a path to continuing that. Um, He was losing the fire in his belly, so to speak. And I was at Chester at the time and I knew that Chester, we were looking to expand. And one thing about Carl is that he, he was, I always joked with Carl that if Mayberry, North Carolina had an engineer, he would be it. You know, because he was just, he just had that kind of personality. He was just, just a nice guy. And um, I could see him at, at Floyd's Barbershop, you know, talking to guys about, you know. And um, so I said, well, before you do anything, let, let, let me talk to my guys and see what we can do. And one thing led to another, and we wound up, Chester wound up acquiring Carl's firm and brought him into the mix. And he's just recently retired from Chester. So, you know, those types of, that's what it's all about. Yeah, relationships. Building relationships. And loyalty and caring about each other. Right, right. And remember people. So then let's go to, that's the two DCAS mentors. Then you mentioned Bob and Marvin. Talk about each of them as a mentor. Well, Bob, Bob was a technical mentor. And at a time when I really didn't, if you would have asked me at that point what a civil engineer was or did, I wouldn't have the slightest idea. I was going to school to be a teacher. Uh-huh. You know, I was raised by teachers. My father uh-huh. was an educator. Um, every influence in my young life were teachers, coaches and teachers. That's, you know, he coached football and basketball. That's who I was around. I, mean, I grew up with their kids and, you know, those were my influences. So I was going to go be a teacher. I figured, what a great gig, you know? And my dad always said, anybody time, anytime anybody would ask him what's the best things about teaching, he'd say June, July, and August, you know? And I'm thinking, okay, I can make a living and I can, you know, hang out, co- you know, coach a little ball, do what I do. And, you know, well, I mean, life had a different plan, you know, so in, you know, life's all about compromise. You know, I, I was, I was thinking about this when I came in because of all the construction, you know, one thing you will never, ever hear me do is complain about the condition of the roads in Pennsylvania. Everybody loves to do that, but I won't do it because if I do, then I can't complain about all the construction cones in the summer. So, you know, that's why I sent you the text. I thought, ah, you know, this is, I don't know how this is going to go, but, um, I, I learned about that compromise from Bob Quinn and, and, you know, Bob, to this day, I can't tell you what he saw, okay? I know I've seen it in people, you know what I mean? And I've never been one to look at a person, because of Bob Quinn, I've never been one to look at a person on the outside. You know, I, I open the book and read the book before I make any determination on anything or anybody. You know, and like I said, Bob Quinn was the chief engineer at Westmoreland Engineering. He was... Is he a Mon Valley guy? He's from Uniontown. Okay. He was from Uniontown and uh, very, very similar, you know, very similar, very, very high school sports based, you know, kind of culture. But um, you never would have believed that Bob could do what he did. You know, he was just a guy. They were, he didn't put on any airs for anybody. He wasn't somebody that went out and tried to impress anyone. And in fact, he's the guy that told me, you know, you impress people when you don't try to impress them. OK, that was it's that was kind of his big line that that he always went with. And um I've always taken that, and my dad always said to me, and I know other people have said this, but my dad always said, if you walk in a room and you're the best guy there, get the hell out of there as fast as you possibly can. You don't belong there. And so with that and with Bob, I've always surrounded myself with the best people I could possibly find. Uh I mean, without a doubt. I don't want to be the best guy on my team. I want to help lead everybody else to become the best that they can be so that we can become a very – and I use the, 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 the basketball analogy. You know, we had arguably the best player in the WPL for four years. Never won more than 14 games. Kid averaged 30 points a game, had, I can't tell you how many 50-point games, had a 60-point game. School record, okay? 
But until we became a team. And this is at Charleroi? This is at Belvernon. Belvernon. And when we were really good, we never had a kid average over 15 points in a game. We would have six kids score 10 to 12. And we're the number one ranked team in the state of Pennsylvania, class AAA. What, so, years, what years was that kid? What was his name? Vince Graham. And what years was he there? Um, graduated in 94, 95. Okay. And uh, Vince is just a super young man. He's you know, probably about 40 years old now. He has a family, has four old boys, and he's just doing incredibly, incredibly well for himself. He's yeah. just a super, super young man. But because he was so good, other kids didn't step up to their full potential because they kind of deferred to Vinny. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when, when, as we gradually became a team, we became much better. So my thing is, you know, surround yourself with great people. And, you know, you don't make the team great as a leader. The team makes you. Right. right. So and that's. So let's go to um, Marvin, was it? Or? Yes, Marvin Williams. Marvin, there's a, uh, there's a club globally, the FOM club, Friends of Marvin. Mm -hmm. And um, I, Marvin, Marvin's an attorney by trade. And um, he's a Yale Law graduate, um, has never done, like me, no technical background whatsoever, but he's been in the engineering industry for his entire career and um, because he knows people. And Marvin's approach to marketing and business development is common sense, okay? Your, your business, regardless of what industry you're in, is business, okay? Mm -hmm. it's, it's people. That's, yes. that's what it is. That's what drives it. People drive business and business fulfills people's lives. That's, that's the whole sequence of business. But what Marvin did, he taught me how to take and package something very technical and very difficult into something that a lay person could understand. Okay? And that's the key. You, you don't, you have so many different dynamics and different personalities and different skill levels in the engineering industry because you're coming from a very technical place, but you are presenting a project, a proposal to very non-technical people. Mm -hmm. Most boards, most, especially in the public sector, they're not engineers. Right. You know, they're people who are volunteering just like us. So to take that technical package and bring it down to the level where, and not intelligence-wise, but where they can grasp the whole process and, and the value of what you're presenting to them. It's a No BS Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. That's Jamie Proton, a Mon Valley guy. He's our second Mon Valley guy to be a guest. I follow up to Tom Rodriguez, who he knows personally. Oh, yeah, third. Well, Tony would say he's a Newark, New Jersey guy. Because, <laughs> you know, so, uh, but yes, Tony's a Mon Valley guy as well. We've all seen it on this show, I jokingly say, or, or maybe smelled it, BS in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Give me an example from the past. It could be a company culture, questionable leadership, poor work ethic, a lousy customer service, a time when you just had to say that's BS. Well, th that's interesting that you asked that because that's really what led me to where I am right now in my career and, and starting this consulting business. Um, one of the things that in, in a previous employer that really – made me have to call BS was the, the culture. Um, it was a culture that didn't support its people. It wasn't a people centric culture. And I saw too many good people leave that building and go home to their families just broken every day. And to me, that's unacceptable because again, while your customers are people, your employees are people that's how ties everything together. Um, and we had, some really talented people in senior management roles who weren't allowed to fully utilize their talents. Um, there was the CEO of that company is very ego driven. Um, and that happens with a lot of people once they get to that level, you know, most CEOs, their, their world ends at the tip of their nose. Exactly. Okay. And, and, but if you can rise above it, then I think it's, you know, th you can, you can get around that. But when you're in a smaller firm, a smaller condensed firm that's trying to be something and you have that one dominant ego-driven personality, yes. you can't give past it, you know? And so that was, that was the difficult piece. It was the culture. It was, it was the culture of the company that um, was micromanaging to the point where it was hurting its people. So let's take the converse. When's a time when you had a big learning experience or a, a teachable moment 
when maybe you were the BSer. Looking back, when is it something that you learned, uh, changed, realized maybe you were full of a little BS and you had to change? And, oh, yeah. And how can our audience learn from it? I think we've all been in that in that place at some point or another. I mean, you haven't done anything if you haven't had your own level of BS. You know, exactly. um, you know we're all just going out and trying to make our way. I think most people are making things up as they go. I don't care how educated or experienced you are. You know, every day is different. You know, you, you don't have two days alike in a row. So one of the things that, that really taught me was that with that same company, you know, I found myself taking advantage of those same people that I was feeling for because they were going, they were being broken. And I had to really kick myself in the seat of the pants and really actually Marvin kicked me in the seat of the pants and said, Hey, you know, what are you doing here? You're, are you, are you the problem or the solution? And when I sat back and really looked at it, I, my, my leadership style has always been to go out and do what I do to the best of my ability, live the best life that I possibly can. And hopefully my team is watching and they're getting inspired to do the same thing for themselves. So uh, Marvin kind of slapped me in the back of the head one day and said, hey, you know, be the solution, not the problem. And it was all a part be- as a result of that culture, that micromanaging kind of stifling culture that I got caught up in. And that was, um, that was on me because I knew better. Profound stuff that you first part you said was we all kind of, we all have been a BSer at some Absolutely. point. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when I asked this question, I've had a couple of guests that kind of skirted it, and I probably should have pushed back a little bit because it is about being vulnerable, and we've all been there. And I ta- often tell the story where I was the same way as you. When I was at one company, I was the worst me because I allowed the culture right. to impact me, and I wasn't strong enough to fight back from the culture. That's exactly and, right. And then something hits you, like a mentor or somebody tells you, and that's what happened to me at that same place. I had a mentor say to me, mm-hmm. you might be the problem too, dude. Right. And then right. you go, whoa, and it's, it's just amazing. So that's great stuff, great stuff. The No BS Marketing Podcast is brought to you by Mass Solutions. Put our three-step No BS process to work for you. Marketing Intel to learn the real story about your customers. A marketing roadmap that puts you on the right path. And messaging that moves customers, prospects, employees, everyone. Visit MassSolutions.biz today to take your marketing to another level. It's all about bold solutions, no BS. It's the No BS Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. We're with Jamie Proton. And we're going to talk about a a lot of different things uh, today and one, but I do want to make sure I give you a chance right now as we, we, we uh, end up, the show ends up being two episodes because we have mm-hmm. so much stuff to talk about and we like to split it up to give people time to listen to it while they're working out or whatever okay. and while they're driving. I want to make sure we spend some time on the Proton Group, how you formed that because you've gone through your whole career path. You've talked about your mentors. Now you're the guy and you have this whole network of hundreds of people Talk about the first day, the first month, the first year. I often say on this show how at Mass Solutions, the first year, you know, it was. I kept asking, I have to do that. <laughs> so tell me about it now that it's your thing. Well, that's that's the eye opener for me. And actually, I'm I'm in month six, so I'm not even anywhere near the first year. And it, it's it's kind of sorta what I thought it would be, but it's also not. Um, the the frustrating part is. Um, some, you know, the first, the first project I had first client, I, um, I turned around to have one of my, one of my people do something and then there was nobody there. And, um, the things that I was used to delegating, I have to do myself now. And, um, you you know, even the unpleasant things, you know, invoicing and collecting, you know, I, I never had to do that. So those are the types of things that really got my attention so far. I underestimated that. And, um, you know, I, I never thought that your, your business development guy, the guy who's your relationship manager, should be the guy coming to you for collections, okay? And to me, that's a sure way to just ruin a relationship. You know, I, I want that, I want to do, I, I've always kind of fell back into that good cop, bad cop stuff. You know, in the engineering business, it's a little bit easy because you have a project manager assigned to a client, okay? Alcasan, for example. And then you have a relationship manager assigned to that same client so if there's an issue if we're out 45 60 days which they never did by the way but still um you need a collection i don't want my relationship guy going out there you know and and banging on the door 
you know, I would rather have the guy who they're looking at him for technical expertise. So he's a good project manager. He's a good engineer. Him going and knocking on that door is not going to ding him in any way, shape, or form because he does good work and they say, oh, you know, he's, he's doing what he has to do. But if that relationship guy, the only thing he's bringing to the table is, is that liaison, that relationship builder between my company and the client, um, that, that's going to ding him a heck of a lot more. So that's, to me, has been the difficult part. And plus, you know, some of my clients, especially the local ones here in southwestern PA, I, I, I've done a lot of things for people over the years, over my career. I've tried to give back to the communities. And then I go now to, uh, to uh, a different, a little municipality, for example, or a municipal authority, and I give them a proposal and they'll look at it and say, didn't you always do this stuff for us? <laughs> Did we, now we have to start paying you <laughs> you know that does so it was um it, it's it's been a little bit of a mixed bag it's been interesting um i'm i'm excited about it i've committed to it and, you know i'm not that's the one thing marvin told me he said you know you're going to do this one thing you do is don't look over your shoulder commit 12 months take a block of time and commit to it no matter what happens come hell or high water keep moving forward and don't look over your shoulder and and that's where i'm at now i'm in month six and you know we're 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 having good months and slow months and we're, we're making it work the most important piece to a small business is the psyche of the top person mm -hmm. keep that in mind because when you get down, that will impact the entire company and that network of hundreds of people that you're right. with. And when you officially do hire your first or second or third or fifth employee, your psyche is important. That's a good point. It's a very good point. And when we've struggled, it's been because of my psyche. <laughs> so, so you have to really keep your, um, your perspective, which is so, 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 so hard. Right. And I wish I could say that it's going to get better, but it's going to get worse before it gets better, brother. I got <laughs> 12 sure. years last week, so I'm I can sure. tell well, you. Congratulations still, on that. That's a big deal. It's still so hard, but as I said in my blog post about the 12th, it's the most gratifying 12 years of my career. I've had tremendous, tremendous stops in my career. Amazing mm -hmm. multi-billion dollar companies, C-suite offices. I had secretaries for my secretaries. I had every perk imaginable. None of that can touch. Excellent. When you build your own team and you have people that you care about. And that's nah, weird to say. I care the people that work on my team. I love. Excellent. And I think they love me. So, well, I, th I, I think you know. that you have to. And, you know, if you're if your people don't love you, then the people that you're marketing to that you're your customers. OK, well, they're not going to love your firm. You know, that's they're the first people that will find that out, you know, and they'll know that your people don't love you before you will. And I think that's a that's a very important point, is that in that whole coming around to treating your employees, your team as family, as people, you know. And leadership is about love, in my opinion. You 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 have to love what you do. You have to love the people you're leading. So that's a that's a very important word in business that's often overlooked. It is, and you're finally seeing a shift where it's okay to be emotional uh, in a leadership position. Mm -hmm. I get teased by Tom Rodriguez and those guys. Uh, they call me Dick Vermeil. I'll get up and be giving a speech at the end of the season. And I'll start almost crying, and they call me Dick Vermeil. Dick Vermeil being a coach who cried at yeah. the drop of a hat. Right. And that wasn't acceptable 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Now it's not that you should be crying all the time. I'm just saying you can be emotional. You can tell people you care yeah, about it's, them. It's much more accepted. It's I agree. Much more accepted. So what's the ideal client look like for the Proton Group? Not Don't say who your current two, three, five, ten clients are. Just if you're going to get your next client, what, what, not by name, what do they look like, feel like, smell like? Uh, the ideal client for me is one that gives me an opportunity to give back. Okay, it's not it's not always about the number at the bottom of, of a P and L's name. Okay, um, that's important. Nobody goes into business to to not make money. That's what that's why you go into business. But at the end of the day, if you can't take a piece of that and do something good, then you're wasting your time. And I've I've always been one to measure success by the way I impact the lives of people, not by how much money I make, not by you know when I was when I was when I was making fifty thousand dollars a year, I, I I needed to make a hundred thousand dollars a year to be successful. You know, when I was a, a director, I needed to be a vice president to be successful. And when I achieved those things, I realized that it was empty. I mean, that wasn't anything to what I thought it would be. But the people that that loved me, the people that were supporting me and mentoring me, knew that I had to find that out on my own because I've always had to work harder 
than that guy next to me. You know, that civil engineering grad from Pitt, okay, couldn't do it anything better than I could. But on paper, he was much better than me. Okay, so I what, what did I have? What, what tool did I have? What arrow in my quiver could I use to combat that? I had to outwork him. I had to put my nose to the grindstone and outwork that guy. That was the only that's the only tool I had. So, you know, once I found those things out, I realized that the true measure of success is really impacting the lives of people. That's what it's all about. So that's what I look for. Uh, it could be it could be a public sector client. It could be a private industry. It could be a nonprofit. What's the biggest two or three things you do for a client? So if a listener's out there that maybe could use your services, what are the, what are the two or three things you do the most? Um, business development strategies, not sales. Um, if, you have, if you have a sales team, I will do sales training, leadership training. Um, but the, the most important thing I do is sit down with you, your, lead, your, your technical team, your sales team, and, do, and help you to develop a business strategy okay and out of that will come a business plan and if you need sales we can do that as well um a lot of it includes marketing because marketing is a piece of that overall business development plan and i do a good bit of public outreach and education type work um that's a kind of a sideline thing that came out of when i was at aecom um i was asked to write a piece for the alka sand consent decree program the for the epa and they were putting the program together and um, the guy I worked with, Dave Bingham, good friend of mine, uh, he and I drafted the Alcasan public participation plan and municipal coordination plan because you have 83 individual municipalities in Allegheny County that are tributary to Alcasan, city of Pittsburgh being the largest of the 83. Different dynamics, different demographics, completely 83 completely unique individual municipalities. So... That experience was something I really liked. I really liked that public contact piece. So I do that in strategic situations where it makes sense. But uh, primarily, it's the, it's the tr- strategic business development planning and marketing. Jamie, how can listeners contact you if they'd like to learn more about what you do? Um, I, best way to contact me is via email, just to theprotongroup at gmail.com. And um, I'm very accessible, or I'm always reachable at the Chamber of Commerce in Shawroy, the Mon Valley Regional Chamber of Commerce, and, um, you know, different things. But uh, that's the most direct way to get me. Jamie, thanks for being on the show. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. I enjoyed it. To our listeners, thanks for joining us for the No BS Marketing Show. Visit BoldSolutionsNoBS.com for show notes plus additional marketing and messaging resources. Are you signed up for light reading? You'll receive valuable strategies every other week to improve your marketing and transform your message. It really is light, intended to be read in two minutes or less, and it just might trigger bright ideas for you. To sign up, visit MassSolutions.biz. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions.